Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert, and I'm coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Hooded gunmen shot and killed two land rights activists in Honduras, um, the government confirmed on Wednesday. This was the latest in a string of attacks on, on rights groups in the Central American country. Jose Angel Flores was president of the Aguan United Farmers Movement, or MUCA, a group that opposes agriculture companies in a conflict over ownership and use of land. The other activist who was killed, Silmer George, was also a member of the same group. Both were supposed to be under police protection since May 2014. MUCA estimates that more than 150 farmers have been killed since 2009 in clashes over land rights in Honduras. The most emblematic case was Berta Cáceres, the award-winning Honduran environmental rights activist who was shot and killed in her home in March. Joining us to talk about the situation of activists in Honduras is Jesse Friesten. Jesse is an independent documentary filmmaker and the director of the film Resistencia, a documentary about the resistance to the coup against Honduran President Manuel Zelaya. He's coming to us from Montreal. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for joining us at The Real News today. Thanks, sir. So first of all, tell us what you know about this latest assassination of the two Honduran rights activists from the Aguan Unified Farmers Movement, also known as MUCA. Are there any suspects so far as to who might have killed them or who was responsible for having them killed? No, uh, no suspects. Um, and if history is any guide, there likely will never be any. Um, Jose Ángel Flores was the president of MUCA, and it's worth clarifying what MUCA is and what MUCA represents. MUCA is the organization who, following the coup d'etat, uh, they brought together 2,000 families of landless farmers, and they took over the plantations of the most powerful man in Honduras, Miguel Facuse, uh, in one of the most fertile areas in the whole region, all of Central America, the Aguan Valley. These are palm oil plantations. They're very valuable. And these families have a historical link that goes back just one generation to that land. They argue that the land was, was taken from them either through trickery, through violence, through a number of different means. Um, and basically, it's what has resulted from that and what is a long-standing history um, in Latin America, and particularly in the Iguan Valley, of a battle between two models. And this violence that we're seeing, or that we have seen for years now, um, is a response, is a reaction, is a symptom, an indicator of, uh, of a conflict, of a base conflict that's going on between two models. And those models are the corporate model of agriculture and the cooperative model of agriculture. And MUCA represents a group that managed to successfully take back 10,000 acres of palm oil plantations and turn them back into worker-run cooperatives. And still today, they are controlling that land. And as you see, violence uh, is often being used as a way to both try to uh, get MUCA to maybe give the land back or, or, or stop being, um, in some way, uh, stop what they're doing. Um, but more so, I think it's actually more deterrence for all these new groups that we've seen since 2009 all over the country, because similar situations are all over the country. Some say there's up to 500,000 families in Honduras who live in the countryside who have no land. And, uh, and a lot of them are getting organized, and they look at MUCA as a shining example of bringing justice back to the Honduran countryside. And, and I think this violence um, can be seen in many ways as a, as a, a deterrence to stop those groups from getting organized. Right. I was wondering about that, too. To what extent is the state itself involved? That is, the, uh, the two who were killed just recently, and they were supposed to have um, police protection, but were killed anyway. Uh, does this mean that the state itself is involved in some way, or is this mainly uh, a battle against uh, private companies? Well, it's all, it's all mixed, and, and, and without an appropriate investigation, it's, it's very difficult to tell. And that's why you see in the case of Berta Cáceres that the family continues to demand an international independent investigation, because there are no authorities in Honduras that can be trusted to find out who killed somebody, particularly to find out who paid that person to kill somebody and who that person was working for, or follow, follow these trails back at all. So uh, is the state involved? Those protective measures that you talked about uh, from the police, that comes from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So when activists like, or, or the president of this co-op movement, for example, Jorge, uh, Jose Angel Flores, when he, go, he can go to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or an Honduran um, human rights organization can go on, on his behalf and say, we have credible death threats against this man, they will pass on these protective measures, which means that if violence is carried out against him, the Honduran state is considered responsible. So these same measures, uh, Berta Castres had them, Naum Palacios, a journalist who was killed in the uh, Aguan Valley earlier. There, I could go on. There's so many Hondurans that have died while having these, these measures intact. So supposedly, 
according to the, the, how this is supposed to work. The 100 states are responsible for that violence against them. Amnesty International yesterday, after following uh, these uh, most recent killings, declared Honduras a, quote, no-go zone for people defending land, whether that be for ecological reasons or agricultural reasons. And, uh, and so in the face of that, Amnesty International asks for a meeting. The, the, the general secretary of Amnesty International, the director globally, asks for a meeting with Juan Orlando Hernandez, the president of Honduras, and he says no. And right then, the United States says they are okay. Um, they approve of the different steps Honduras has been making in dealing with human rights uh, violations, and they send another along another $55 million in aid. So aid to this regime in Honduras is at the highest it's ever been, and violence against people standing up for justice in Honduras is arguably at the highest it's ever been. So uh, according to MUCA, over 150 activists have been killed uh, in Honduras since 2009, uh, which is just around the time that uh, President Manuel Zelaya was uh, uh, overthrown. Uh, tell us some more about the situation since the coup attempt and what uh, that coup attempt has meant for activists in Honduras. Well, the coup really, uh, just a, a little background, the coup took place on the day that Hondurans were supposed to vote for the first time ever in their lives. Um, for somebody other than who was going to lead them. So what was on the ballot was a referendum over whether or not to rewrite the Constitution by way of a uh, representative constitutional assembly that was going to involve participation of not only people by the region of the country they live in, but also by their profession and by their identity. So it had to be like the LGBT community was going to have a seat at the table, um, for example, or the farmers were going to have a seat at the table, or the taxi drivers. And so that way, uh, all these different interests were going to be taken care of. Um, and that was the day when they woke up to vote in that referendum and instead saw soldiers take control of the street. And those soldiers are still on the street in greater numbers than ever. And as we speak right now, right at this moment, a Copin march, uh, which is the group of Berta Cáceres, um, who is defending the Lenca territory in western Honduras, they had a march today in Tegucigalpa, and it was attacked both by the military police and by the regular police. Um, we know that two people are in custody and many have been injured. Um, and so that, that's, that's happening right now as we do this interview. Um, the lesson, I think, to learn from this is, I think there's many, but one of the lessons for those of us who are outside Honduras is that that moment in 2009, um, in defense of that project of rewriting the Constitution, of having a more democratic, participatory, um, equal society, rose up a movement that, had, that organized so quickly that within just a couple of months, it had um, committees, democratically organized committees, voting by assembly in every one of Honduras's 298 municipalities. And that movement um, could have been our ally. Our governments could have said, we're not going to deal with this coup regime. This, we're going to consider this movement the legitimate rulers of Honduras. They've got the democratic project. They, they, not, they did not take power by arms. Um, and so, and that was, that, was, that was a moment then where we could have seen a... Uh, we could have accompanied the people in Honduras that are now being killed, like Berta Cáceres and, most recently, Jose Ángel and, and Silva Dionisio. As you know, right now, we're, of course, here in the United States, uh, involved in the middle of a presidential campaign. And one of them is uh, Secretary, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who, uh, who uh, apparently played a role in uh, Honduras. Can you just quickly uh, bring our listeners up to speed as to uh, what uh, her role was in this and what you might expect from her should she become elected president? Yeah, um, Honduran journalist Felix Molina said, listen, I know you guys have up here, you, I, you, I was recently with him when he was speaking to a crowd here in, in Montreal, and he said, I know you guys up here have a lot of different ideas about Hillary Clinton, but for us, she's just a coup leader. And that's because Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State at the time of the coup. And as a result of uh, WikiLeaks and her email releases, and even stuff she published in the hardcover of her autobiography, which then was taken out of the softcover, when you put that all in the paperback, when you put that all together, you get a picture of Hillary Clinton as one of the key players in the Honduran coup, and somebody who her and her staff actually were celebrating uh, when the overthrown government was not brought back to power. And so in that situation, you can just imagine the perspective of Hondurans who see in their country, I mean, uh, just to give you a sense of, of how the U.S. is is seen and, 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 and historically is in for Central America, there's a joke I've heard in all over Central America, which is, why are there no coups in the United States? And the answer is because there's no U.S. embassy in the United States. 
And so when you see that your country is so clearly dominated, I mean, it's like over 65% of Honduran trade is to the United States. Um, you know, so much of the military, I mean, the military, the police are basically uh, completely funded by the United States. I mean, when you add up all these things and then you see the two options in the U.S. election, when you're hoping that something's going to change up there to allow you to take some control over your, your reality, um, some sort of democratic control over your state, you're, you're seeing that maybe you need some change up north first. And then you look up and you see Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. I mean, it's just, it's devastating. Well, just turning quickly back into uh, the activists in Honduras, what are they doing now? How are they reacting to this, uh, this wave of assassinations? I mean, I think the, the reaction is, uh, is typically to denounce it, to try and get the word out, um, and to call for an end to military aid, uh, to call, I mean, the, the, the immediate reaction is immediately, all, all, almost always by activists in a situation like this, is to say, we consider the Honduran state that took power by way of a coup d'etat responsible for this violence, if not directly, indirectly, by not allowing us, by stop using a coup d'etat as a blunt instrument to stop a process that would have gotten land to farmers, that would have gotten uh, the Lenka people rights over their uh, territory or had their rights respected. You know, that would have brought at least some sort of progress and process towards justice for all these people that now have to take that land, now have to set up blockades, put themselves in violence, and are eventually killed by these forces. And, and one of the things to point out is just like how unequal a battle this is, for example, in the Iguan Valley, you know, where you've got a corporation versus a co-op. I mean, one of the beauties of a co-op is that the decisions get made by the people who live and work on the land. I mean, that's what makes it democratic. What that also means is that the president of your co-op lives right there. And so he is so vulnerable, as we just saw two days ago, when uh, Jose Angel Flores was walking out of a meeting and was killed. Meanwhile, the leadership or the people that they make the decisions in the corporation likely don't even live in Honduras, let alone do they walk around. Um, and so you, you really see kind of the, the unequalness of these situations and, and the desperation uh, that you see in a lot of these uh, communiques and, and statements that different activist groups or human rights organizations will make in the face of this violence. Okay, well, Jesse, thanks so much for this update. We'll definitely be continuing to follow the story as it evolves, and uh, we'll get back to you. So thanks again for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Okay. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.